So these uh, the shape of the curve. I mean, we we've already seen what the uh, the the curve is, and I've given you a very typical curve, and I'll, I'll redraw it over here. And the uh, uh, the curve tends to look like this, and where it flattens out, notice it has it's kinked right there. That's typically at the ten year mark. We call this an upward sloping yield curve, upward sloping. But there are other shapes to the yield curve as well. Well, how does the yield curve, why does it look the way it looks? Why is the interest rate on a 10-year bond higher than the interest rate on a 2-year bond? Why is it not all just 6% or 5%? Why, are not, why, why do not all bonds return the same thing? Well, have a look at it this way. Let's say you want a 2-year bond. You want to buy a 2-year bond. You have two choices. You can buy, right off, you can buy a two-year bond. You're probably thinking, well, what else can you do if you want a two-year bond? You can only buy a two-year bond. Well, no, you can't. You can buy a one-year bond. So let's, uh, let's write that in. You can buy a one-year bond, and at the same time that you buy the one-year bond, you can enter into something called a forward agreement to buy another one-year bond one year from now. You can buy another one-year bond one year from now today that's called a forward agreement and we're gonna see what that is in chapter 10 see how nice this uh, this stuff is it all works together so we can enter into a contract today to buy a one-year bond and agree to buy a one-year bond one year from now thereby getting a two-year bond well for there to be no arbitrage opportunities remember arbitrage right for there to be no arbitrage opportunities the two-year bond, the return on the two-year mark, must be the same as doing this on the other side. It has to be the same. Otherwise, you would choose one over the other until the price made it that way. So, the slope or the shape of the yield curve is really nothing more than the market than what the market expects interest rates to be one year out, and then after that year is over, one more year out, etc. So. For instance, we don't have to buy a five-year bond. We can buy a one-year bond, enter into a forward agreement to buy a one-year bond one year from now, enter into another forward agreement to buy one year, a one-year bond two years from now, etc., etc. Well, all of those returns must equal what it would be to buy a five-year bond today. And that's the forward rates. That's what's implied by the yield curve, by the way. If you ever hear that forward rates are implied by the yield curve, that's what it is. Here's another example of a yield curve. This is what we call a flat yield curve. Yes, it is possible. It is possible that almost all rates across all classes are very close. We call that a flat yield curve. And then we have something where interest rates on short-term debt are higher than interest rates on long-term debt. This is called a downward sloping yield curve. A downward sloping yield curve or an inverted yield curve and typically we get inverted yield curves just before recessions just before recessions isn't this interesting that just looking at the slope of the yield curve can tell us if we expect an impending recession so expectation theory says that the shape of the yield curve is such that the forward interest rates are what the market expects it to be hence all interest rates reflect the expectation so when we look at the yield curve we can look at it saying that's what the market expects interest rates to be that's power that's absolute power another theory of why the curve looks the way it is is something called liquidity preference and liquidity preference states that hey look if I'm gonna lend you money for 10 years as opposed to one year and lock my money up for 10 years, I want to be paid more for that. So long-term bonds tie up money longer, therefore I need to be paid for it. The other side of liquidity theory says, hey look, if I lend you my money for six months, I only have to sit and worry about it for six months before I get it back and whew, okay, I got it back. But if I lend you my money for 10 years, there's 10 years in which you can default. There's more time for you to really mess things up. So the risk of a long-term bond is higher than the risk of a short-term bond because I have to 
bite my nails longer. So rather than having a bunch of six month bonds that roll over for 10 years, because now I just have to worry about getting my money back in six months, with the 10 year bond, I have to worry for 10 years. This is, this is comes from, by the way, this comes from a theory called liquidity preference to help explain the shape of the curve. Here's the problem with, with, with this theory though. There are two problems with it. It doesn't explain flat yield curves because it says that the longer you lend money for, the higher the interest rate has to be. So it only explains upward sloping yield curves. It does not explain flat yield curves and it certainly doesn't explain inverted yield curves. And we do see flat yield curves and we do see inverted yield curves. So there's something wrong with that theory. The second problem with that theory is I'm not tying my money up for 10 years because bonds are marketable. I don't like it. I can sell it tomorrow and get my money back. I don't have to wait till maturity. So liquidity preferences out there, but let me tell you something. That doesn't really mean much in bond markets that are tradable. Now in non-tradable markets, yeah, it might mean something. Finally, we have something called market segmentation theory. And this also tries to explain the shape of the yield curve, and it, it, maybe it does a, a pretty good job. What it's saying is that there are different buyers for different maturities. That the large investors who buy short-term debt are not the same people who are buying 10-year debt. They're not the same ones buying 30-year debt. And because there's a different market for them, they all have different supply and demand fundamentals so that the shape of the yield curve at any given time does not reflect what the market thinks interest rates are going to be, but what each market for each maturity expects what that maturity is going to be, and that's it. And there's something to be said about this. There, there, there is something to be said about this. But uh, if we're looking at all three theories of why the yield curve looks the way it does, to be able to explain the yield curve in each and every type of, of market, uh, expectation theory is probably your best bet. That makes more sense.